News of the Times Whitechapel Wednesdays Part 9 Welcome to our series of Whitechapel Wednesdays. In this weekly series we cull together news reports in chronological order leading up to the infamous series of slayings. As Ripper enthusiasts will know, there is considerable discussion as to whether the slayings were confirmed only to the five reported. We have included reports outside of the five to show the build-up of terror in the Whitechapel area. We have also included other, sometimes seemingly minor, news stories during this time to give you a picture of the life and times of Whitechapel of 1888, as events build to the series of slayings. In this series we offer no comment, but adhere strictly to the papers of the time, all in chronological order. We hope you enjoy the show. Recap of last week. In last week's episode, Leather Apron is found. Arrests are made and attempts are made to tie all the murders together through a forensic look at the recent spate of murders in the Whitechapel. Concerns are raised over a similarly vicious murder having taken place in Gateshead. Has the Ripper moved, or are they dealing with a copycat? In this week's episode, an update on the Gateshead murder and the gruesome double event. From the Devices and Wilts Advertiser, the 27th of September, 1888. Horrible murder near Gateshead. A young woman named Jane Beatmore, 28 years of age, was murdered at Berkeley near Gateshead on Saturday night or Sunday morning. It appears that she was in delicate health and had been at the gate head dispensary on Saturday for medicine and that on the road home she called at several farms. At half past seven o'clock she left the house of an acquaintance, Mrs Newell, evidently with the intention of returning home. She had not arrived at eleven o'clock and her mother and stepfather went out to look for her, without success and concluded that she must have passed the night at some neighbour's house. Early on Sunday morning, a miner named John Fish found the body of the young woman at the bottom of a railway embankment in a horribly mutilated condition. The county police were communicated with, and an inspection revealed the fact that the lower part of her body had been cut open and the entrails torn out. She was also cut about the face. The body was conveyed home and a doctor was sent for. He expressed the opinion that the cuts had been made with a knife. The affair has caused panic in the district. The resemblance to the Whitechapel murders encouraging the idea that the murderer, who has been at work in London, has travelled up to the north of England. Further inquiries made at the scene of the murder do not diminish the shocking brutality of the crime. The unfortunate woman is stabbed in three places, one in the bowels and twice in the face. The wound in the stomach is very deep, the knife having knocked a piece off the backbone. The body was only a few hundred yards from the girl's home by the side of the colliery railway. Beatmore was last seen at eight o'clock on Saturday night when she was alone and the man Fish found her at about half past seven on the Sunday. From the Shields Daily Gazette, the 1st of October 1888, the Whitechapel atrocities two more women murdered, horrible mutilation, and the description of the supposed culprit. Yesterday morning, the metropolis was thrown into a state of renewed consternation by the announcement 
that the bodies of two more murdered women had been discovered in the East End. This report unhappily proved to be true, and the terrible character of the crimes is intensified by the circumstance that the locality and manner in which the murders were committed point very strongly to the conclusion that the miscreant who is responsible for at least two of the previous murders is also guilty of those crimes. It will be remembered that the first of the series of murders were committed so far back as last Christmas, when a woman whose identity was never discovered was found murdered in or contiguous to the district known as Whitechapel. There were circumstances of peculiar barbarity about the mode in which the body was treated. This fact did not attract so much attention at the time as it did when, on August the 7th last, a woman named Martha Turner, aged 35 years, was found dead on the first floor landing of some model dwellings in Spitalfields, with 39 bayonet or dagger wounds on the body. On the 31st of the same month, the woman Nichols, an unfortunate, was found dead in Bucks Row in Whitechapel. With this probably begins the series of crimes which have lately horrified and terrified the public. For the mutilation of the body was done with so much technical skill and audacity as to suggest a definite but extraordinary and at time unexplained purpose. What that object was, the coroner recently suggested in the summing up at the inquest on the woman Chapman, who was murdered in the same district and under similar circumstances on September the 8th. That crime created almost a panic, which had scarcely died away when it became known yesterday that two more murders of apparently the same kind had been committed under circumstances detailed hereunder. The Mitre Square Tragedy The Central News says the circumstances connected with the murders committed on Saturday night or early on Sunday morning do not differ materially from those of recent occurrences, except perhaps that the Mitre Square crime was perpetrated with bestial ferocity and reckless daring, and rapidly exceeding that exhibited by the fiend who dispatched and mutilated poor Annie Chapman in the gloomy backyard of Hanbury Street on the 8th of September. Mitre Square is a sort of huge yard, about 120 feet square, and there are three entrances to it, the principal being from Mitre Street, which is broad enough to accommodate two vehicles abreast. There is also a short covered court, about twenty yards long, leading into St. James's Place, another square popularly known as the Orange Market, in the centre of which is a urinal, a street fire station, consisting simply of a wagon on wheels and also a permanent street fire station in course of erection. There is also a fire escape there at night, and three men of the Metropolitan Brigade are always on duty until daylight. Another passage, 30 to 40 yards long, open to the skies, known as Church Passage, leads into Duke Street, Two sides of Mitre Square are occupied by the warehouses of Messrs Kearney and Tongs, tea and coffee merchants, and a private house occupied by a city constable named Pierce. The third side is occupied by the warehouse of Messrs Horner and Sons, drug merchants. On the fourth side, where the roadway leads into Mitre Street, one corner is occupied by Messrs Walter Williams and Co., and the opposite corner is used as a workshop and is locked up at night. Next to it are three empty houses, the backs of which 
look into the square. During business hours, the square is extensively used, but after six o'clock is comparatively deserted, and according to people in the vicinity, it is about as quiet a place as could be found in the City of London. It may be added that the square is well lighted, there being one standard lamp in the square itself, another fixed to the wall at the left-hand entrance from Mitre Street, and a third at the corner of the court at the St. James's Place end, and two more fixed in the wall in Church Passage, one being placed at each end, so that altogether there are five lamps throwing their light into the square. Discovery of the Body At a quarter to two o'clock yesterday morning, City Constable Watkins, 881, was on his beat, and as he passed through Mitre Square, he saw a body lying in the south-west corner. He had passed through the square about fifteen minutes previously, and he is certain that then there was nobody there. The corpse was that of a woman, and it was lying on its back in the southwest corner of the footway, with the head towards a hoarding and her feet to the carriageway. The head was inclined on the left side, and both the arms were extended outward. The left leg was extended straight out, and the right leg was bent away from the body. After the first shock of the discovery, the constable bent down and felt the body, which was found to be quite warm. Blood was all around, and on the body, but it had not congealed. Watkins immediately ran across to George James Norris, a night watchman in the employ of Messrs. Kearney, and sent him to Dr. Sequeira's at 34 Jewry Street, and then proceeded to call up Constable Pierce, who lives in one of the houses in the square itself. The constables then returned to the southwest corner, and throwing the light of their lanterns fully upon it, found to their horror that the woman's throat was cut from ear to ear, and halfway round the head. The clothes had been raised to the chest, and more horribly still, the body had been completely ripped up from the pelvis right up to the chest, the flaps of flesh being turned back and revealing the intestines. In addition to these fearful injuries, a portion of the right ear was also cut off, and the nose was slashed halfway through. The face was also slashed and cut about in the most brutal fashion, and a portion of the intestines were also placed on the neck. Dr. Securi arrived at five minutes to two o'clock, and shortly after that time, Major Smith, Assistant Chief Commissioner of the City Police, Detective Inspector McWilliam, Chief of the City Detective Department, and Superintendent Forster and Inspector Collard, of Bishopsgate Street Station were on the spot. They had been preceded, however, by Dr. Brown, surgeon to the City Police Force, while Dr. Phillips of Spittle Square, surgeon to the H Division of the Metropolitan Police, who had previously examined the body of the woman found in Burner Street, was also present. The doctors proceeded at once to make an examination of the body. It was lying in a pool of blood, which had flowed from the terrible wound in the throat, and there was also a considerable quantity around the abdomen. The ground around was eagerly examined by the police, but it soon became clear that the murderer had carefully avoided treading in the blood, and consequently no footmarks could be seen. At the conclusion of this preliminary examination, the body was removed to the city mortuary of Golden Lane, where, in the course of the afternoon, an exhaustive post-mortem examination was made. As soon as the corpse had been removed from Mitre Square, the southwest corner was carefully washed down, in order to disappoint morbid sightseers, 
and it was not long before all traces of the awful crime had been removed. A sketch of the place was also made under the direction of the police in charge of the case. The victim. The following is the official description of the body and clothing of the woman. Age, about 40. Length, uh, 5 feet. Dark auburn hair. Hazel eyes. Dress, black jacket with imitation fur collar. Three large metal buttons. A brown bodice. Dark green chintz with Michaelmas and Gordon lily pattern. Skirt. Three flounces, thin white vest, light drab linsey underscoat, dark green alpaca petticoat, white chemise, brown ribbed stockings mended at feet with pieces of white stocking, black straw bonnet trimmed with black beads and green and black velvet, large white handkerchief round the neck, and a pair of men's old lace boots and a piece of coarse white apron. The deceased had O on the left forearm tattooed in blue. The Bernard Street Murder The scenes of the other outrage, says the Press Association, is a narrow court in Burner Street, a quiet thoroughfare running from Commercial Road down to the London Tilbury and South End Railway. At the entrance to the court are a pair of large wooden gates, in one of which is a small wicket for use when the gates are closed. At the hour when the murderer accomplished his purpose, these gates were open. Indeed, according to the testimony of those living near the entrance to the court, they were seldom closed. For a distance of 18 to 20 feet from the street, there is a dead wall on each side of the court, the effect of which is to enshroud the intervening space in absolute darkness after sunset. Further back, some light is thrown into the court from the windows of a working man's club, which occupies the whole length of the court on the right and from a number of cottages occupied mainly by tailors and cigarette makers on the left. At the time when the murder was committed, however, the lights in all the dwelling houses in question had been extinguished, while such illumination as came from the club, being from the upper story, would fall on the cottages opposite, would only serve to intensify the gloom in the rest of the court. From the position in which the body was found, it is believed that the moment the murderer had got his victim in the dark shadow near the entrance to the court, he threw her to the ground and with one gash severed her throat from ear to ear. The hypothesis that the wound was inflicted after and not before the woman fell is supported by the fact there are several bruises on her left temple and left cheek, thus showing that force must have been used to prostrate her, which would not have been necessary had her throat already been cut. When discovered, the body was lying as if the woman had fallen forward, her feet being a couple of yards from the street, and her head in a gutter which runs down the right-hand side of the court, close to the wall. The woman lay on her left side facing downwards, her position being such that, although the court at that part is only nine feet wide, a person walking up the middle might have passed the recumbent body without notice. The condition of the corpse, however, proves pretty conclusively that no considerable period elapsed between the committal of the murder and the discovery of the body. In fact, it is conjectured that the assassin was disturbed while at his ghastly work and made off before he had completed his designs. All the features of the case go to connect the tragedy with that which took place three quarters of an hour later, a few streets distant. The obvious poverty of the woman, her total lack of jewellery and ornaments, 
and the soil condition of her clothing are entirely opposed to the theory that robbery could have been the motive. Motive and the secrecy and dispatch with which the crime was effected are equally good evidence that the murder was not the result of an ordinary street brawl. At the club referred to above the International Workmen's Education Club, which is an offshoot of the Socialist League and a rendezvous of a number of foreign residents, chiefly Russians, Poles and Continental Jews of various nationalities, it is customary on Saturday nights to have friendly discussions on topics of mutual interest and to wind up the evening's entertainment with songs, etc. The proceedings commenced on Saturday about 8.30 with the discussion on the necessity for socialism amongst Jews. This was kept up until about 11 o'clock when a considerable portion of the company left for their respective homes. Between 20 and 30 remained behind and the usual concert which followed was not concluded when the intelligence was brought in by the steward of the club that a woman had been done to death within a few yards of them and within earshot of their jovial singing. The people residing in the cottages on the other side of the court were all indoors and most of them in bed by midnight. Several of these persons remember lying awake and listening to the singing and they also remember the concert coming to an abrupt termination. But during the whole of the time from retiring to rest until the body was discovered, no one heard anything in the nature of a scream or a woman's cry of distress. It was Louis Demi Schultz, the steward of the club, who found the body. Demi Schultz, who is a traveller in cheap jewellery, had spent the day at Westow Hill Market near Crystal Palace in pursuance of his avocation and had driven home at his usual hour, reaching Burner Street at one o'clock. On turning into the gateway, he had some difficulty with his pony, the animal being apparently determined to avoid the right-hand wall. For the moment, Demi Schultz did not think much of the occurrence, because he knew the pony was given to shying, and he thought some mud or refuse was in the way. The pony, however, obstinately refused to go straight, so the driver pulled him up to see what was in the way, failing to discern anything in the darkness. The Michels poked about with the handle of the whip and immediately discovered that some large obstacle was in his path. To jump down and strike a match was the work of a second, and then it became at once apparent that something serious had taken place. Without waiting to see whether the woman whose body he saw was drunk or dead, Demi Schultz entered the club by the side door higher up the court and informed those in the concert room upstairs that something had happened in the yard. A member of the club named Kozimbrodzinski was familiarly known as Isaacs, returned with Demi Schultz to the court and the former struck a match while the latter lifted the body up. It was at once apparent that the woman was dead. The body was still warm, and the clothing enveloping it was wet from the recent rain, but the heart had ceased to beat, and the stream of blood in the gutters terminating into a hideous pool near the club door showed but too plainly what had happened. Both men ran off without delay to find a policeman, and at the same time other members of the club, who had by this time found their way into the court, went off with the same object in different directions. The search was for some time fruitless. The police summoned. At last, however, after considerable delay, a constable was found in Commercial Road. With the aid of a policeman's whistle, more constables were quickly on the spot, and the gates at the entrance to the court having been closed and a guard set on all of the exits of the club and the cottages, the superintendent of the district 
and the divisional surgeon were sent for. In a few minutes, Dr. Phillips was at the scene of the murder and a brief examination sufficed to show that life had been extinct some minutes. Careful note having been taken of the position of the body, it was removed to the parish mortuary at St. George's in the East Cable Street to await identification. The description of the body. A representative of the Press Association who has seen the corpse states that the woman appears to be about 30 years of age. Her hair is very dark with a tendency to curl and her complexion is also dark. Her features are sharp and somewhat pinched and as though she had endured considerable privations recently. An impression confirmed by the entire absence of the kind of ornaments commonly affected by women of her station. She wore a rusty black dress of a cheap kind of sateen, with a velveteen bodice over which was a black diagonal worsted jacket with fur trimming. Her bonnet, which had fallen from her head when she was found in the yard, was of black crepe, and inside, apparently, with the object of making the article fit closer to the head, was folded a copy of the Star newspaper. In her right hand was tightly clasped some grapes, and in her left hand she held a number of sweetmeats. Both the jacket and the bodice were open towards the top, but in other respects the clothes were not disarranged. The linen was clean and in tolerably good repair, but some articles were missing. The cut in the woman's throat, which was the cause of death, was evidently affected with a very sharp instrument, and was made with one rapid incision. The weapon was apparently drawn across the throat, rather obliquely from left to right, the gash being about three inches long and nearly the same depth. The body identified. A telegram received early this morning says the woman murdered in Burner Street has been identified as Elizabeth Stride, who it seems has been leading a gay life and had resisted latterly in Flower and Dean Street. Inquiries made amongst her associates elicit the fact that the deceased who was commonly known as Long Liz, left the house between six and seven o'clock on Saturday night. She then said she was not going to meet anyone in particular. It is stated she was of calm temperament, rarely quarrelling with anyone. In fact, she was so good-natured that she would do a good turn for anyone. Her occupation was that of a charwoman. She had the misfortune of losing her husband in the Princess Alice disaster on the Thames some years ago. She had lost her teeth and suffered from a throat infection. That concludes this episode of Whitechapel Wednesdays. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We're aiming for 1,000 subscribers. If you have already subscribed, our sincere thanks for your support. We very much appreciate it. We upload five times a week. Wednesdays, Whitechapel Wednesdays, where we chronologically go through the newspaper stories related in Whitechapel leading to the series of gruesome crimes in 1888 and arguably beyond. Thursdays, an in-depth investigation into a famous story of its day. Fridays, we present a pooled together collection of stories from our database, for example, murders on railways. Saturdays are our serial killer Saturdays, when we review one of the historical serial killers in our large database. And Sundays, a new series we are trialling, Eccentric Sundays, where we look into Great Britain's rich history of quirky, odd and eccentric characters. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. 
You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.